Today on Swarty and Harry, we interview Greg Taylor. He's one of the founding members of Steam Whistle Brewery. Steam Whistle is famous for their Pilsner. Pilsners are originally from the Czech Republic. Steam Whistle beer has only four ingredients, malt barley, natural spring water, hops, and yeast. Yeast makes with, what does this say? <laughs> Swarty wrote this. I'm not reading this. Hi everybody, I'm Swarty, and this is Harry Brown. We're here with Greg Taylor, co-founder of Steam Whistle Brewery out of Toronto. Uh, this is a very special beer clock of Swarty and Harry Takeover. Um, yeah, so there's a very actual unique connection between Greg Taylor and St. Mary's, so I'm going to let Greg uh, tell you all about that. Well, I grew up here. <laughs> That's pretty simple. Actually, I was born in Toronto, and, uh, and then when I was six, we moved to St. Mary's. My dad got a job in London, so we moved to St. Mary's and uh, started going to Central School, Central. grade one, met all the guys, and I had a great, uh, great childhood here. What a, what a wonderful town compared to Toronto. Wonderful town to grow up in and, and uh, lots of fabulous memories. My parents are still here, so that's why I'm here today, actually. So how did you end up with Steam Whistle? Well, that's a long story. So <laughs> I... Uh, Went to uh, Toronto with the U of T, actually. I uh, was there just for two years. Took economics, and it was really not my cup of tea. So I decided uh, to take off. Worked with my uncle down in uh, West Virginia, selling frozen pizza. Lived in his basement. And uh, that was interesting. Uh, had this little concept of a metal pizza oven, and we'd give it to restaurants as long as they would buy our frozen pizza. Oh, OK. Pizza was terrible, and uh, <laughs> so, you can say uh, that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it was. but I my my idea was to convince my uncle to let me make the pizza, maybe rent a kitchen on the weekends because I didn't know anyone down there, and make fresh pizza, and then I could go out on Monday with a product that I was proud of. And I'll never forget we sat down at the, the dinner table and I presented this idea to him, and he said. Greg, we're not in the business of making great pizza. We're in the business of making money. And I knew that was a mistake. I mean, I respected my uncle, but I just knew that for my customers, what really mattered was great product. And uh, that's something I carry with me from there. Because I just knew if a business was to be successful, you needed to, uh, to meet consumer expectations on your product. So I left there, came back to Toronto, and uh, I got a job couple other small jobs, bike courier, but I met a young lady, a lady named Sybil Brown, and she uh, was working at the Upper Canada Brewing Company. She had gone to Laurier, was going to Laurier, and had a summer co-op term there. So uh, I just loved the place, thought what a great place to work, and eventually I got a job part-time delivering beer for them. And uh, I just uh, worked away at that. I, I, you know, at the time I hadn't, didn't have a degree, a degree, and I just thought it was a fabulous place to work, so I really put my heart and soul into it and did my best and eventually I uh, got a sales job so I moved from de uh, deliveries to sales and then I started help helping out in the office with the distribution administration because I had been doing deliveries and eventually I took over the, the sales force and that business grew over 10 years and was one of the larger craft breweries in, in Canada. And then uh, Sleeman uh, came in and bought the company. So we were all uh, let go. Uh, they actually closed down the, the brewery. was in Toronto, of course. Closed down the brewery and uh, moved the production to Guelph. And then laid off 125 people. Wow. And all these things happened. But uh, great learning for us, that whole process. We called Upper Canada Brewing Company. It was really the uh, University of Craft Beer for us. We learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. And uh, a year later, the gentleman that started Upper Canada invited everyone back on a, on a one-year anniversary uh, canoe trip. We used to always go on these canoe trips in the summer with all the staff. And it was great. He invited us on this trip. We got to see everybody we'd worked with for so long. And late that night, it was up in Algonquin Park, late around the campfire. It was probably five or six of us, but only three of us were up chatting and uh, started talking about maybe the whole idea of Phoenix Rising, that we... What we were doing by then, for all of us, wasn't really our passion. We wanted to get back into the beer business. And uh, so we came up with this idea of calling a brewery Three Fired Guys Brewing. And that would be, uh, 
the name of our brewery, and you know, it, it told a, an important story. My partners were, were Cameron Heaps, who was the son of Frank that started Upper Canada, and then Greg Cromwell, who actually had been my boss. That's why we were called the Three Fired Guys. And, uh, and by the way, I'll just mention in there that my wife Sybil suggested we consider other names because <laughs> it was a bit of a negative connotation to Three Fired Guys. <laughs> and back in that era, crazy names for craft beers were not that popular. Craft beer was not that popular, so people were weary of it. So we decided, let's pick a name that was uh, something that people could all relate to and, and would potentially be, uh, you could uh, sell a beer with a name across the country and, and people would be able to relate to it. And, and, and the story is we were looking for buildings and we were on a building, the roof of a building in the distillery district of Toronto. And I said to my partner Cam, you know, we're going to have this overbuilt quality, uh, age of innocence, retro look and feel to the brand. We should put a, a steam whistle on the roof and we'll blow it off at five o'clock and then all the white collar folks that work downtown Toronto will, will see it and hear it and they go, oh, it's a great time to have a, a nice craft beer. So uh, Cam said to me, well, why don't we use that as, as an alternative name to Three Fire Guys Brewing because we hadn't come up with anything better. And uh, on the way home from that visit uh, to the distillery, we realized that that uh, Steam Whistle was probably a great name because it was an icon that everyone understood. It meant the end of the work day, uh, time for your personal reward. And, uh, you know, the image, really Fred Flintstone was the only owner of the brand of, of Steam Whistle up till then. So uh, that's when we decided to, uh, to call it Steam Whistle. And back to the original part of the, the original question, sorry, we, uh, Sybil and I, 10 years older than Cameron, at the time, we used our house to acquire the original loan from the Royal Bank. Wow, that's pretty nice. That's collateral, it was. So I remember we sat down with Cam and, and Greg. Now, the other Greg at the time uh, had married an Australian woman. He'd been married for five years, and he decided that they decided to move back to Australia. So when it came to the construction of the brewery, Greg actually wasn't around. Uh, and uh, it was only uh, Sybil and I and, and Cameron. But, we were pretty adamant that what we needed to do in an era, and by 2000, import beers were really starting to sell well. Craft beer was starting to really plateau to, to decline in sales. So we decided, well, if we're going to compete against import beers, we need to focus. We need to get Pilsner right. And then once we meet consumer expectations and we have a great product, then we'll talk about another flavor, but we just knew another style. But we knew from our experience at Upper Canada with 36 different beers, it was very hard to get every recipe and nail it. And there was a lot of variances out of a small facility. So the idea was, let's just, let's just do one beer and let's get it right. And then if we're comfortable, we'll look at other options. But Eventually what happened was two years in, we had a, a marketing guy come to us who wanted to sell us his services. And we weren't interested, we didn't have the money and we really believed that we wanted to have our own staff be the ones who developed all the creative for the brand because they were their most instant, intimate with it. Anyway, he said to us, you know, my partner and I stood up in front of the roundhouse and we asked 200 people what they knew about Steam Whistle. And they said, first of all, they knew you were in the roundhouse. But more importantly, the second most common answer was that you guys, for some reason, only made one beer. And uh, it's hard when you when you develop a brand. It's hard to change people's perspective once it's launched, unless you key in on something that they know. So his suggestion was: tell people why you only make one beer. His assumption was about quality, and that's of course the reason because we knew we need to focus. If we want to become an expert at it, we need to focus. And uh, so we loved his idea and he presented this concept of do one thing really, really well. So uh, we thought about it and we thought this is good. So we paid him for that idea. That was, that was my next question. Did he yeah. actually, because if he's watching, you know, <laughs> that was my idea. <laughs> paid him, paid him uh, for the idea and, and, uh, and then we, we took, took over from there and we've used that ever since. And what he said though, after I remember, we paid him and he said, remember guys that if you're committing to this concept and you're communicating, communicating to consumers that you're only going to make one beer, you can never go against that promise. So you really can never make another style of beer. 
or else you're going against what you what you've said. And so to this day, we stuck with that. And it's Incredible. Worked. It's worked. It tastes good. So <laughs> you're doing something right. Mm. Mm. So tell us about the uh, roundhouse. How did you come to end up there? Well, we, we pulled together uh, the loan from the Royal Bank, thanks to them, because it's hard to get uh, loans as a small business startup. And we got uh, a bunch of private equity, private folks that, uh, that brought their own money to the table. And, uh, and then with that, we had the opportunity to invest in some equipment, which we got from Montreal, from another, another small brewery that was closing down, so it was used equipment. And the only thing standing in the way of uh, getting things going was finding the location. So we actually had signed on to a, a, a building in Don Mills that was really pretty unexciting. And as we developed the brand and our ideas, we came up with this concept that I learned from a, a guy, well, Greg's Ice Cream, which is a, a popular uh, handcrafted ice cream shop in Toronto. And he told me, you know, what you really need to do if you're going to build a craft brewery is you need to build a cathedral of beer. You need to meet and exceed customers' expectations <laughs> about what a craft beer is all about. And uh, don't, don't commit to anything until you've got a place that is fantastic. So when people go there, they'll go, wow, this is even better than I thought. And we, we signed on to this place in, in Don Mills. We had a lot of pressure from our investors to get going. But I don't think they really understood, as we did, how important the location would be. And I remember when we were panicking that we were going to have to move into this place that we didn't like, I said to Cam, let's just jump in the car Monday morning and we'll find our place on our own. We had used commercial realtors, but they really didn't know what, in our heart of hearts, what, what the great location, what a cathedral of beer really meant. So the first place we went to was the Roundhouse. We drove up to it. I remember it was a rainy Monday morning and I jumped out of the car and ran up and looked in and went, wow, this is, this is it. Like, if we could get this place, it would be fabulous. And uh, so we, there was a phone number and we gave the guys a call, and uh, it was probably took six months to convince the city because the, the actual building, the roundhouse, and the park was owned by the city. Uh, CP Rail gave it to uh, City of Toronto. Yes. So it, it took about six months to get approvals and get a lease signed, but we did that, and then we got it going. It took us about, only about eight months to build the place. And wow. in March of 2000, the first bottle of Seamless came off the run. That's that's fantastic. Um, I've been told that the actual original roundhouse was actually moved brick by brick. Is that true, or is that just uh, no? It's true. Stale? So, uh, sometime in the mid '90s, there was a uh, there was a requirement to expand the uh, convention center, the Metro Toronto Convention Center. So what they did was they took over Roundhouse Park, they tore down one third of the roundhouse. So. The roundhouse has base one to thirty-two. They took dismantled base one to eleven, dug down and put a six-story building underneath it, and they actually stored the roundhouse up, offsite brick oh, by brick, that's numbered crazy. it all, and then rebuilt it. So when we found it, it was like a hundred-year-old brand new building, because a lot of the structure uh, when they put it back together it was dry rot in it, so they had to get new. Um, wood from, from out west where it originally came from. It had, had used all original fabric. So what a wonderful spot it was and it still is today because of the fact that it has been reconstructed. It's, it's significant. It gives it a great, great feel. <laughs> Can you uh, maybe tell us a little bit about the beer and how it tastes the way it does? Yeah, well, you know, we, we learned back in the Upper Canada days that uh, of the styles we made, the most popular one we sold was the Lago. So when you know getting into our own adventure, our own venture, we thought first beer we're going to make will go with that type of style. So we chose Pilsner. You know the original Pilsner comes from uh, the Czech Republic, and uh, it was developed at the time. So before Pilsner Urquell, which is the original Pilsner, uh, there were no lagers or Pilsners. Uh, the ale yeast was predominant beer sold in the world, and a German brewmaster in the Czech, or working for a Czech brewer, came up with this recipe and they played around with it. And it was really the first crisp, clear uh, beer that was uh, fermented at a colder temperature. And uh, you, you could see through it, right? Um, so we liked that idea and uh, we pursued uh, a 
Pilsner recipe, a Pilsner style of beer when we first sat down and talked about what we were going to do. We actually hired a German brewmaster to do it. Uh, according to Origin, it was a German guy who originally did that. But I don't want to cut you off, but does he have his own bed in the brewery? Okay, well that, yeah, that's part of the story. So he, uh, the that's German the best guy... That's <laughs> no, 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 it's great. So the German guy, uh, Harold Sawada, he was with us for about four years. Developed the recipe, did a great job, and then he wanted to retire, so he helped us find a new guy. And that new guy, uh, Marek Makunda, was uh, an original Czech uh, guy from the Czech Republic. He actually had gone to uh, brewing school in grade nine, so grade nine to grade twelve, you uh, get a certification to become a brewer, and then become a master brewer. You go to university for four years. And then you have four years of practical there, actually. So it's like becoming a doctor. Wow, crazy. Your own. <laughs> and uh, he worked at uh, Pilsner Urquell for five years. And then he decided to move his family to Canada. And he was working up at a lab, actually, in Creamore, Creamore Spring, Creamore, Ontario. We got his resume and uh, went up to, uh, to see him up in Creamore. Interviewed him, never forget the interview. He, he had his daughter there. And she was 15 at the time. And he uh, he said, uh, we sat down in a pub. And I said, is the young lady going to join us? And he said, yes. She will judge you. <laughs> said, really? Okay. Monica was her name. And uh, his English wasn't great and hers was very good. So uh, we interviewed him. And then, and then we came back up a week later to make him an offer. And we sat down at the same bar and Monica wasn't there. But he said, guys, first thing he said was, I've decided I will work with you. Okay, sure. <laughs> we were going to make an offer, but I guess we don't have any choice. Um, <laughs> and he said, on two conditions. I said, okay, wait, what's up? He said, well, that used brew house you got from Montreal, it's got to go. We need a real Pilsner brew house that's built in the Czech Republic, and I know exactly who I can get to make it, and then ship it over here. And uh, that way you've got a true Pilsner, the decoction brew that he wanted to make, which we love the idea of, and we talked about it. And, uh, and then he said, I said, so what's the second request? And he said, I, I, need a, I need a bed. I said, you need a bed? Like, where? He said, no, I need a bed in the brewery. I said, why would you need a bed in the brewery? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, the beer, she does not wait for me. That's <laughs> right. That is commitment to beer. <laughs> Good. And cheers, by the way, guys. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much for doing this. For sure. No, mm. A big thank you to Greg Taylor for coming out and talking with us tonight. If you would like to find out more about Steam Whistle, you should head to Toronto and take their tour. They're across from the Rogers Centre, minutes away from the CN Tower. Uh, you can find this video on Facebook by uh, searching Swerty and Harry Take Over. Uh, look us up on YouTube, uh, hashtag St. Mary's Famous. Thanks for joining us.